28. We have been talking about the harlot in Revelation 17, and she's riding a what? She's riding the beast, the scarlet-colored beast. And so we talked about that last week, and we learned some of the characteristics of uh, the lady that's riding the beast. She is called a harlot, and it's not really per se a person, but it is a false religious system that is coming during the tribulation period, and this false religious system, the desire is to control everybody on the earth and for everybody to come under the religion we gave up. Examples last week of all the things the Pope has been doing, he has also come out and said that it is dangerous to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I didn't have time to get the headline, but I have it. He has, he's coming out saying more and more, turning people from the truth, any truth that was in God is in God's word, and I believe he is the one that is manipulating. We know he's going all over the world. We've seen those headlines where he is trying to gather a lot of religious leaders under his uh, human fraternity bill that he came out and he signed with uh, the Sunni Islam uh, person. And then he has been all over trying to get more religious leaders on board. We know that they are building, they have plans to build that Abrahamic faith place and open it for the opening of Chrislam in 2022 in Abu Dhabi. So we know a lot of things are going on. You don't hear about it so much, but there are people that are out there trying to find the news that most people won't report and they are trying to connect it to prophetic events that are in the Bible. So we know all of this has been going on for a couple of years, and it's, it's, it's out there on the stage of the world now, and it's not so hidden anymore. It's coming out there. And so we uh, look, and I think that that is that religious system. The woman is a religious system riding this scarlet beast. Well, I want to go back and look at Jezebel. Because Jezebel, I also believe, is a type and will show us many things that we need to understand about this false religious system that is coming just around the corner. Because I believe the seven-year period is just right around the corner. And so we want to compare and see if we see differences and can we learn anything about Jezebel that will help us understand about the harlot. So y'all with me on the purpose of the lesson? Good. Now, we looked at Revelation 17, verse 5 last week, and it says, it's describing the scarlet, uh, the woman on the scarlet beast. And it says in verse 5, on her forehead is her name, and her name is Mystery Babylon the Great. She's the mother of all harlots or all prostitutes. And we learn, what does that mean? Every religion, she is the mother of it. Every false religion comes out of her which came out of Babylon, and she is also the mother of all of earth's abominations. Now that's quite a system that is going to be on the earth during the tribulation period, and I think we are seeing the foundation being laid right now. We have learned, as we've studied the past few weeks, all false religions originated where? In Babylon with Nimrod and Semiramis at the Tower of Babel. What was the attitude? Rebellion against God. If God says this, we do the opposite. And God said, I want you to scatter and fill the earth and replenish the earth. And they said, no, what are we going to do? We're staying right here. We're going to build ourselves a name. We're going to build ourselves a city because they were all interested in what exalts man, their success, and their status. And so every false religion comes out of that and that attitude. Now, do you agree that most religions today are nominal Christianity? Yes. Do we have a lot of churches even anymore that speak the bold truth of God's word, call people to repentance, and they call sin, sin? And they tell them that hell is a real thing. 
We don't have that many left, not even in the Baptist, Southern Baptist Convention. We have leaders that are going away, and they are not teaching the bold truth of God's Word, and they are also talking about social justice. And so we talked about that last week. Is it right to feed and clothe people that need it? Yes, but they say we do that and show them the love of Christ, but they're not teaching them the gospel. They don't present the gospel. They only are taking care of physical needs. So has this permeated, this false doctrine of nominal Christianity, is it permeating society here in America? Yes, even among churchgoers. We, want, we don't want to offend anybody, right? So we don't want to call sin, sin. We don't want to tell them that they can find freedom in Jesus Christ. This is nominal Christianity. Many people that call themselves a Christians may go to church on Sunday morning. They might put a little money in the offering plate and that they've paid their, their dues. And that's about it. This is a false doctrine and we need to be cautioned about it because there are wolves in the pulpits. There are many wolves in the pulpits, and where does all this come from? Babylon. Anything to exalt man, we're not calling sin, sin. We're not telling people about heaven and hell and that they can find freedom in Jesus Christ. That is a, if you're not doing that, you're not teaching the truth of God's word. Now, we want to study a little bit. We're going to use Jezebel today. And the reason we want to study this because we want to make sure that we understand all the effects of Babylonianism because we do not want to go after one little iota of it. Because as the devil laying traps and snares to draw us in, yes. And is it easy to get caught up in something that exalts our flesh a little bit? Yes. So we want to be looking out for those things so we avoid it. There is a swelling tide in the United States, especially, of people who are leaving the truth of this word. And what are they doing? They're going after anything that teaches something that makes them feel good about themselves. Somebody came into a church years ago and said, I really like that preacher because I feel good about myself when I leave. No. Is the word of God convicting? Yes, it should be convicting us, it should be encouraging us, but it also should be stomping on your toes sometimes, right? Yes, because aren't we all wanting to be changed and be obedient and changed into the image of Christ? So we're not ashamed when we stand before Him. Yes, so you've got to keep the truth of God's Word. Now, a lot of people are hunting religions. Is there a void in everyone's heart that only God can fill? And so they're out hunting anything that will fill it. But most of the religions that they go to and where they might fit in with New Age or whatever it is, it is all going to lead them back to Babylon. Because all roads are going to go right back to Babylon. And there's snares and traps all along the way pulling people in that direction. Now, here's a person. How many religions are in the world? <laughs> I mean, we can't even... There's probably, we couldn't number them. So do people have many options? They do. They have a lot of options, and people visit around and trying to find something that uh, maybe makes them feel good, something that their flesh can even enjoy. So we have a problem here. There's a lot of religions, but there's really only two religions in the world, and one of them is the truth of this book. This is the true religion and everything else is lumped into one category, and they're false. And they go back to Babylon. So there's really only two religions. You either have a choice to get under someone who's teaching you this, or you have a choice to get under someone who's not teaching you this. And if they're not teaching this, they're teaching false. You all agree? Okay. Now... If we do any kind of a compromise, people love to compromise, don't they? Like they're compromising right now on the LGBT issue. They don't want to call the transgenders and tell them lovingly, point them to the truth of God's word and they can find freedom in Jesus Christ. So as people begin to compromise, what do they do? They take a little bit of truth and then they stuff it with a bunch of false doctrine. We call that syncretism. And so that's, you see these stickers about coexist? 
I was stunned several years ago, and I felt, saw one on a car in Bartlesville for the first time. It's been several years. And I, do they really know what that means? That's getting everybody under one religion. You can have your God, I have my God. You have your way to get to heaven, I have my way. We're just all learning to coexist. That is not biblical. And that is not going to lead anyone to heaven. So it can really affect the walk of a person that's trying to live for Jesus Christ if they start any compromise in their life. Your walk will be greatly affected. So we're in chapter 17 of John. Where is John? He's on the Isle of Patmos because he's been exiled, right? And Jesus, he's, Jesus has got him in the spirit, and Jesus is dictating the letter of revelation to him. Is he showing him all these things that are future? Yes, so the stuff in Revelation, has it happened yet? No. So here's John, and he's out there, and Jesus begins to describe this great religious system that is going to be coming during the time of the tribulation period. And the great religious system is going to last how long of the seven years? Three and a half. Good, y'all remembered. Three and a half years, this terrible religious system that will be oppressive to the true Christians. And it will last three and a half years. John says it's a great counterfeit, and it has a name. It's called Babylon Mystery Religion. Now, as John's writing and he says, he's giving us a warning, there's a counterfeit religious system coming. It's coming and you need to be prepared for it and it's got a name of Mystery Babylon. And where can we trace that to in the Bible? The early Old Testament days, about Genesis 11. And there's a group of people who have risen up in defiance against God at the Tower of Babel. And so we can trace it all back to there, this counterfeit religion. So we're going to read the first six verses of Revelation 17 again this week, but we're approaching it from a different angle. So in verse 1, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with John and said to him, Come here, John, I want to show you the judgment of the great harlot, and she's sitting on many waters. Now, we found last week when you sit on many waters, you have a lot of influence over a lot of people because the waters are usually people and nations. Now, she is having the kings of the earth are coming to her. She has influence over the kings of the earth, and they commit fornication with her. The inhabitants of the earth are just drunk with the wine of her fornication. And we learned last week, that's all of her false doctrines. Everything, oh, I love this, is what she's saying. And people get drunk on it, and they revel in it. Because, well, I'm going to this church because I feel good about I, That pastor makes me feel good. I can be in sin, and it doesn't matter. I have a license to sin. Do people want to hear that? Yeah, most people don't want to come to a church that steps on their toes. The average person doesn't. But many of them want to find something, and then they just get drunk with it. A person said they, uh, like, we'll take the example when Laura became transgender, because I have other people that their children are doing this. They're hunting a church that will approve it and affirm it. That's the wine of her fornication. It's all the false teaching and the false doctrines, the seductive lies that she's told. So here's the beast, uh, the woman writing. He carries me away in the spirit into the wilderness. I see she's sitting on a scarlet-colored beast, and that beast has names full of blasphemy. He's got seven heads, and he's got ten horns. Now, we've seen that beast before in Daniel. Now, she's dressed in purple and scarlet. She's got gold and precious stones and pearls. She's got that golden cup in her hands. It's full of abominations and filth. Quite a religious system. You think it's a religious system that is coming. Now, harlot, remember, is a religious system. Now, it will have a head who's gathering other people to be the heads with him, but it is a religious system. It goes on in verse 5, her name's on her forehead, Mystery Babylon, and she's the mother of every harlot. She's the mother of every false teaching and every false religion. And she is drunk with the blood of the saints. That's what she just loves, killing the saints of God. 
She's going to be the one that will have kill many of Jesus' uh, professors in the tribulation period. Do you remember? I think it's about Revelation 9. The souls of the martyrs are under the altar and asking God, How long? Oh, how long? Because there will be many people martyred for their faith even in the tribulation period. So we need to understand the harlot is a powerful religious system that has long deceived and ruled over numerous people, nations and peoples, and even the kings of the earth are entrapped with her. Remember, the kings are committing fornication with her. The inhabitants of the earth love everything she's teaching. I found somebody that will give me a license to sin. Isn't this wonderful? Well, it is till you take your last breath. She's beautiful exterior, right? Very impressive on the exterior. She has a golden cup in her hand. What's in that cup? All the filth that she pours out. All the abominable things that is involved in this mystery religion. Now, she deceives many by her appearance because she looks great on the outside. She looks like she has a lot of wealth. She looks like she has a lot of luxury and authority. And her actions are an abomination to God. We do not want to get involved with anything of this one world religion that's coming. Satan frequently ensnares. You remember our lesson a couple of weeks ago on the lure of Babylon? Satan will ensnare. Do a lot of people have a lust for power? And if they get a little power, does that make them want more? Yeah, we know that's true. And so people that are lusting for power get entrapped in all of this, and it drives them away from the true worship of God. And they just get more and more power. Now, have we had instances in uh, time in history past where you had the union of church and state? Oh, think of Constantine. And then when, for a thousand years, the popes became really more important and had more influence than even the kings of the empire. And terrible things happened. So the alliance is forged by the false religion. It's going to unite church and state because you've got the woman and the beast. She is the religious part. He is the political part. They're going to be together for about three and a half years, and you, it will be like never before. Horrific things happened under Constantine, and horrific things are going to happen during the tribulation period. Remember, she's drunk on what? The blood of who? All of the saved, all those that are born again, all those that testify of Jesus Christ as their Savior, that's the blood that she's after. And we know that during the period of the Dark Ages... Many of the popes who said that it was from God, their instructions were from God, they killed all kinds of people who were following the truths of God's word, and they about exterminated several groups of people from off the face of the earth, like the Waldensians and the Albigenses and some others. So believers who are on the earth during the time of the tribulation period are going to experience the wrath of the harlot. Her power source, who's the Antichrist? He's that beast. And who gives him his power? We learn in Revelation 13, Satan the dragon. So we have a very satanically inspired religious system and a political system during the tribulation period. Now, will there still be people born again? Yes. Will it be difficult? Very difficult, and it will cost them their lives. The term harlot is used throughout the Old Testament. It's always a metaphor for a false religion. Were there many false religions? Yeah. Did the Israelites have trouble with them? Yes. They were always getting wrapped up in the false religions of their neighbors. And it caused them for God's anger to be poured out upon them. And remember, any religious practice, anything anybody wants you to do, that's not in here. It is spiritual fornication. And I'm sure you can think of some examples. I think, I, I keep going to the Catholic Church, but I keep thinking of things like you counting the beads. All these things that you have to do. Is that in here? 
No, then it is spiritual fornication. So we have to be very careful. So we're going to go to Revelation now, chapter 2. And we're going to go visit one of the churches. And we're going to Thyatira. And why are we going there? It is the most corrupt church that had been on the face of the earth. And there's poison being preached in the pulpit. And we have many churches today that are just like the church of Thyatira. If there's false teaching going on and there's poison, the whispers of Satan coming out in the pulpit or whoever is teaching or preaching, that's the church of Thyatira. So we're going to go visit them and see the message that God gave to them. They are the fourth church. We had Ephesus, then you had Smyrna, and then Pergamos, and now we're at Thyatira. They are the church that was in, uh, they were very influential for about a thousand years. From the 6th to the 16th centuries, we call this the Dark Ages, and we know it was the Catholic Church. You can just go back, and that's even in secular history, what the Catholic Church was doing, how they were very influential all over Europe, and how they killed thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Christians. So this is the message to that church of Thyatira. And we've got somebody in our church, and what's her name? Jezebel. And God is, Jesus is t dictating this letter to John, and he said, this church has a problem because they've got a woman in the church, a Jezebel, and she, y'all are allowing and permitting her to teach false doctrines and false teachings. So the church is being called on the carpet because they're allowing it and they're permitting it when they know it's false. So let's see what Jesus has to say. Let's, first of all, I'm going to give you just a little bit of background on the Jezebel back in the Old Testament so you understand more the character of the woman in the church of Thyatira because we're not talking about literal Jezebel in the church, right? It's a person that has that character quality. Now, for more than 2,000 years, Jezebel has been saddled with a reputation as the bad girl of the Bible, right? Right? Was she the wickedest of women probably ever on the face of the earth? Yes, she was. Now, and you remember that proverbial question when I say, she was the most wicked, and the audience says, how wicked was she? Okay, come on, y'all. Oh, let's look in. Let's dive into it, and we're going to find out how wicked she was. She was called the she-devil. That's pretty wicked, right? She was extremely depraved, so we want to look at her. She is a heartless woman. She has a bloody history, and she belied the name that she bore. In other words, what her name meant, she was nothing like it. Laura's name means victorious spirit, but for about 18 years of her life, she was not a victorious spirit. But finally, she lines up with what her name means. This gal, she never did line up with what her name meant. Because Jezebel, depending on who you look at, can mean a chaste woman free from carnal connections. Wow, now if you know anything about Jezebel, that's the exact opposite of what she was. She was nothing like what her name means. She was by nature a very licentious woman. She was evil and did despicable, abominable acts. She was a voluptuary. I didn't know what that meant. But it's a person devoted to luxury and sensual pleasure with all the tawdry arts of a wanton woman. Well, what's a wanton woman? They're lascivious, they're promiscuous, they love to pose in expressing sexual desire, a wanton pose, very seductive, very alluring. She was marked by unprovoked, gratuitous maliciousness. She was capricious and unjust. That is, that's quite a description of a female. Thus, no name could have been more inappropriate for this despised female other than a name that means she's chaste and free from carnal connection because she was extremely carnal, very carnal, and she was not a chaste virgin at all. So let's look at her family connections. I have a little map up here so we can, you can get an idea. I hope you can see it. 
if you look in the country kind of in the bottom right that is yellow this is the nation of Israel denoted by a red dot okay now if you move up to the upper left corner of the map you see a yellow dot on kind of a little reddish country that's where she's from she is from the land of Phoenicia of the cities of Sidon and Tyre she is a princess of Baal she is a high priestess, a royal priestess of Baal. Her dad is Eth Baal, who is king of the Sidonians. She is very powerful, she is ruthless, and she's dedicated. And what does she want to do everywhere she goes? Promote the worship of Baal. Promote the worship of Baal and the Asherah poles. So that's her background. And we know from 2 Kings that she also practiced witchcraft. Now, Ethbaal, her father, murdered his predecessor so he could get the throne. Does murder run in the family? Yes, absolutely. Now, if you look at the map up here again, the lowest arrow, which is kind of a little peachy color, pointing to a dark purple. Everybody found it? That's the, that's the southern kingdom of Judah. Okay, the one right above it, the white arrow uh, with Ahab on it, he was the king of the northern kingdom. So the ten northern kingdoms is where he was a king. Were there ever any good kings in the northern kingdom? No. Because they were after Jeroboam. Remember, the Bible says all those kings followed in the footsteps of Jeroboam. Now, if you go up to the top arrow that says it's yellow, Eth Baal. So that gives you the, the geographical location of how close Phoenicia was to the northern kingdom, where Ahab was king. Now, the Phoenicians were a remarkable race. They were outstanding. They were great maritime people. people. Remember, they've got all this coastal line on the Mediterranean Sea. But they were idolaters. And so they were a group of people that said, here's our god, Baal, you can have your god. And they just considered Jehovah as just one of the, the many gods of deity. And they called Jehovah the god of the land. See, because they're on the sea. Now, this is a political marriage, which is exactly what the false religious system that's coming in the tribulation period, riding the beast, who's the political, this will be like a marriage between them. It is believed that the heathen Phoenician princes married Ahab, who was king of Israel, Ahab, so they could seal a profitable trade alliance between Israel and Phoenicia. This was the first time a king of Israel of the ten tribes up there allied himself by marriage with a heathen princess. Is he already in trouble? Has he already broken God's law? Yes. yes. Now, as a Jew, Ahab sinned against God's law. Should he have known better? He should have, because he's marrying a heathen who is not even an Israelite. Her father's name means Eth Baal, which means he's a man of Baal. That's your father-in-law. Jezebel is very ambitious. She's very proud, and she wants to eagerly seize the opportunity to share the throne of a king. Now, think about the tribulation period. We have the beast who's going to be the political, right? And the religious system is going to be supported by she he is going to support the religious system and she is going to dominate him for a while so we have that same kind of an alliance coming in the tribulation period now as queen jezebel exerts an extremely evil influence over the public affairs of the northern kingdom and the worship of god in heaven is she going to be controlling oh yeah she's going to be very controlling and ahab marries this woman who is like a choleric on steroids. <laughs> now, y'all, if y'all know what a choleric is, <laughs> okay. Now, so we want to look at the church at Thyatira because this is Jezebel's church. She's being allowed and permitted to teach all this false stuff. And we want to compare her now with the harlot that's riding the beast. Now, here's the letter to the church at Thyatira in Revelation 3. What's the first word? Oh, that's like that word, but, isn't it? However, because he's just told them five good things about them. And then he says, 
Nevertheless, in spite of all your good things, I have a few things against you, and here it is. You are allowing for her to teach and seduce. You're allowing for her to teach and seduce. And this woman is Jezebel, and she calls herself a prophetess, and that means she's saying that she has direct communication with God, so the things she's teaching are from him. Now, you're allowing this woman, Jezebel, to teach and seduce. What does that mean? Get people off of the right path. Because in each church of the seven churches, are there believers in each church? Yes. So there's some true believers, but you're allowing and permitting her to teach things in the church that are going to lead people off of the right path. Casey calls them my servants. To commit sexual immorality and eat things that are sacrificed to idols. So what's our problem? We've got this Jezebel spirit in the church, and she is teaching and leading people away from the true teachings of God's word. Is she very influential? Absolutely. Are they allowing it and permitting it? And that's what God's getting onto the church about. Because you are tolerating it and letting it go on. This reminded me of Paul's, uh, and I think this is Acts 20. And remember, Paul had been in Ephesus for three years, and he's getting ready to leave. And Ephesus, if you look back in history, was a very idolatrous city. And who was their main goddess that they just worshipped? Diana. Remember, everything was all about Diana. And Paul's getting ready to leave, and he says, I know false teachers, and they're like what? Vicious wolves, and they're going to come in where? Among you, and are they going to spare any of the flock? No, they're going to be after all the flock. And he said, they will even come from your own number. That's a scary thought. They will even come from your own number. Men are going to arise, and they will distort the truth. Remember from Jude, a uh, characteristic of a false teacher, they use plastic words. What does it mean if I use a plastic word? It twists easily, and I can make it to mean what I want it to mean. They rise, and they distort the truth, and what's their purpose? They want to draw you away, and you become a disciple of them. Right? And follow their teaching. And he says, you be on guard. This also reminded me of the verse that we use with our prodigals, 1 Timothy 4.1. The Spirit expressly or clearly says that in the latter times, some are going to fall away from the faith. What is fall away? That means they abandon or they depart from the faith. Which faith? The faith that they had? No, the faith that was once delivered to the saints. They're falling away from the truth of God's word. That's what we learned in the book of Jude. And what are they giving heed to? What am I paying attention to? Deceiving, seductive spirits. Doctrines of demons. So here's Jesus, and he is going to confront this church, and he says in this short letter, he says, I'm going to expose her, I'm going to expose her teachings, and I'm going to tell you about her judgment, what's going to happen to her. Now, he's confronting the what of the church? The tolerance. Oh, we're tolerating sin. Well, you could say that about many of the churches in the U.S. today. They're tolerating the sin that is going on, and they don't call the sin out because you are allowing this. They are allowing this woman to lead people away from the true worship of God. She's teaching them a false system of worship. That's exactly what seems to be happening on the world stage right now. It is going to be a false system that will lead people to hell. And she's teaching them about worshiping idols and eating things things that are sacrificed to idols. So the church in Thyatira had become intimate with a false god and a system of worship. Now, if, we, if our church started following false teaching and false teaching, what happens in the church? It's more and more corrupt. Are we moving away from spiritual and what God wants us to be? Are we beginning to look at sin and say, well, that's not so bad? Yeah, 
the corruption just increases. So Ahab and Jezebel, this pair together, ushered in the worst period in Old Testament history for about 60 years. And they reintroduced the worship of Baal and also get the children of Israel in the northern kingdom to worshiping Asherah. Remember the Asherah poles? We've talked about them. So over 60 years, idolatry is going to make terrible inroads into this church and into the life and the way of the nation of Israel, and it drags the nation down to new depths of degradation, which is exactly what we see in America right now. Now, at first, you know, she doesn't start out as severe. And at first, it seems like Jezebel and Ahab were content with religious pluralism. You know, you could worship Yahweh, you know, you, or you can worship Baal. You can worship both. We don't care. You know, that's kind of what they're saying in this inclusive thing. Remember, they are planning when they introduce Chrislam, they're going to have a church, a synagogue, and a mosque. You know, and people just kind of do their own thing. But we see this here in America today. And the one thing that is intolerable is that I make an exclusive claim that my God is the true God. And they say, that's your opinion. You know, you can believe that if you want to. Now, to think that my religion is a way to God is fine. I just think it. It, it starts out, I don't care really what you think. You know, if you want to say that Jesus Christ is the only way, that's fine for you. And that's, I'm thinking it. But now, what if I begin to say it and I begin to teach it and say that this religion and this book is the only way to God? It is hate speech, and they will not tolerate it, and they, their anger just comes up, right? And they, I am the problem. I am the problem, not them. Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the life, and he is the only way to God the Father. So we have a problem that people don't believe this is the authority of God's word. I mean, that's the root of the problem right there. Jezebel was not content for people to have an option. This is the same thing that happened in the Catholic Church in the Dark Ages. You cannot have an option of whether you're going to serve this God or the gods that, that uh, they chose. She wants the worship of Yahweh eliminated. That's what they're going for in the U.S. right now. And what is happening in California, we won't, be, it won't, we won't be too far behind. I mean, we need to be preparing our hearts and preparing ourselves for what's coming because there are some severe things already happening in some uh, countries, not countries, states, in some counties because ultimately they want the worship of God of the Bible eliminated. That's it. And you should be able to see that just watching what's going on in the world. That is the spirit of Babylon to kill everything that's associated with the God of this book. Now, what's the unpardonable sin to, according to them if I say the way to God is exclusive? Israel's God was God alone, and to serve him, you must serve him and no other gods before you. True? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, she began to systematically kill all the true prophets of God. And we know she was successful to a degree. She had an extraordinary force of character. She was savage, she was relentless, and this proud and strong-minded uh, woman carried out all of her foul schemes. She was a gifted woman in many ways. But do a lot of people take the gifts that God has given them and they prostitute them out for evil yes and that's exactly what she was doing and her misdirected talent the talents that she was gifted with became a curse instead of being used for good and to further uh, the worship of God she was very persuasive but her influence was wrongly directed and this church in Thyatira was allowing it and permitting it and it was killing the spirit of the church She's resolute above other women, and she used her strength of character. She's going to destroy the king, King Ahab. 
and she is going to destroy her own offspring as well as pollute the life of a nation and they're going to be judged mightily by God. Jezebel has stamped her name on history, all that is designing and crafty and malicious and revengeful and cruel. It's quite a legacy. So I ask each one of us, we need to examine our hearts. What kind of a legacy am I leaving? What kind of a mark am I leaving for the people that know me? Jezebel, a name which means in all ages a striking proverb. You think of seductive power. You think of worldly subtlety, a wickedness of the absolute worst type. And see, we're also talking about the religious system that is coming for the tribulation period. Now, she was an ardent idolater, and she was devoted to Baal. And were the Israelites told to have nothing to do with the gods of their neighbors? Yeah, they were instructed not to. Now, she had zeal. She makes me think of, the, of Paul when he was Saul. Remember, he was going out doing God's work, killing the Christians. Her zeal for the worship of Ashtaroth, of the Sidonians, is unmatched. She is just zealous, and she takes care of all these prophets. She has hundreds of idolatrous priests. And she's using them to go out and to get everybody in the nation of Israel to worship Baal. Now, she's guided by no principle. She's restrained by no fear of God or man. There's our problem. She has no fear of God. She's passionate in her attachment to her heathen worship. She spares no pains. Whatever it costs, we're going to get idolatry in the land of Israel. And all of its splendor. She's the outsider. Now this, y'all get your brain where mine is, all right? Okay. Okay, open your brain and let mine come in <laughs> for a few minutes. Just think about this and relate it to America. She is the outsider. She comes into the land of Israel where she's the foreigner. She is passionate, and she's determined, my religion is coming in your land. Y'all with me? See, that was what my brain was thinking when I was doing this yesterday. We see this. Absolutely. She was the foreigner. She was the outsider. She chose to come to Israel, but I'm going to change you so you're like me. Worship my God, my rules and everything. We have seen this. Ahab took as his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal. He was the king of the Sidonians. And then he, the king of Israel, starts worshiping Baal and serving him. Yes, yeah, she should not have married him. That's true. Now, what does he do? He builds a temple, and then he puts an altar in this house for Baal. And he's worshiping Baal. If your leader's doing it, what's going to happen? A lot of the people are going to follow. And it says in 2 Kings, they used divinations. They were using enchantments. They sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord. They provoked him to anger. And they are sacrificing their children alive into the fire. Now, here's Jezebel. And she, whatever she does, she wants Ahab and all the other people to follow her, whispering the poisons of Satan into his ear and into anyone who listened to all of her prophets. She had Asherah poles, and she did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him. This is a wicked... Ahab has just... He has, he's hook, line, and sinker, Right? with those trappings. Now, if you look at my map up here, Jezebel, the very, I'm going to the very top square, up where the blue arrow is. Jezebel is an avid Baal worshiper. She's from Sidon, a city far to the north of Israel. Now, do you remember what Jeroboam did when he became king of the divided kingdom? He didn't want them going... He was king of the northern ten tribes. He didn't want them going down to Jerusalem to the temple. 
So what did he do in the land of, the, of Israel, the ten tribes? He put two golden calves, right? So they're beginning to serve uh, idols and worship idols from the very beginning of the nation of Israel. Then if you see the pink arrow there, uh, Ahab lives in Samaria, which was the capital of Israel. He builds a temple to Baal, and then he sets up Asherah poles. Now, this is in God's land, right? This is in the Israelites' land. So we see all the wickedness that's gone on. We talked about Asherah poles a couple of weeks ago. It's a sacred tree or pole. Now, in the Canaanite religion, they would have an altar, and then they put the Asherah pole next to it. And what did God tell them? Don't you dare, when you build an altar to me, put an Asherah pole by it. Remember, because that's to the goddess Asherah. And if you see the trunk of the tree here, it was usually carved into a symbolic representation of the goddess Asherah. So this is what's going on in the land of Israel at this time. Now remember, she had 450 prophets of Baal that were installed in the magnificent temple they made to the sun god Baal. And she's got 450 prophets and she has another 400, I believe, to Asherah. Now... There it is. Another 400 prophets of Ashtoreth. She made a sanctuary for them. Can you imagine the facility that was built for 850 prophets? And you've got a temple to Baal, and you've got altars to Baal, etc. Now, she's got all of her prophets, 850 prophets in the land of Israel. Are they for the nation of Israel? No, they're trying to convert the Israelites to Baal and Asherah worship. So I've got 850 people, and what am I going to do with them? She takes care of them. They are housed in the palace. They're fed in royal style. And what does she want out of them? They're going out all over the nation of Israel, and they're promoting the worship of Baal all over the land. That's their purpose. And so, but Baal has cruel and licentious rights. They were despicable, a lot of prostitution going on, and with Ashtoreth. And so they're going all over the land promoting the worship of Baal. Now, I found some pictures I thought might be of interest to you. These are some churches here in the United States, and I loosely call them a church. Because here are people that are trying to be more inclusive, right? And... Can you all see the rainbow flag there? Okay. So this is a church whose minister has decided they are all-inclusive, and everybody is welcome in there. And in his little caption underneath, they, they just welcome everybody, and everybody can uh, be who they are. We affirm that the God made you this way. That's a lie. Now, here's another one. And what startled me was they're getting ready to take communion. And what does the Bible tell us? To, about taking communion examine your heart and if you have any unconfessed sin you're not even to take of it and so here we have another one who has gone over to that this is a church i think in the dallas area lakewood church and does it is it very easy for you to see that they are all inclusive i mean they they just have it out there and their sign above says we are affirming inclusive we embrace love and we are exploring our faith Exploring our faith. All right, here's another one. And this is also from a church group called Shepherd Initiative. Now, that sounds good. You know, Jesus is our shepherd. But it says, I am part of God's diversity. God made some gay. He made some lesbian. He made some transgender, etc. Now, these are churches. They're called a church. This has the spirit of Babylon. Babylon in the church now here's another one that says do not deny us and post no hate speech so if we say anything against it is it considered hate yes Yes, and then we're the bad guy because we are not tolerant (coughs) so idol worship meant more to them they're breaking the first two commandments of the ten right because they have other gods before them, and they are making for themselves idols. They're carving things and have idols that they are worshiping. Now, you say, we don't do that. 
really. We have different kinds of idols, correct? And so this little golden bull here, golden calf, he has on himself things about, do some people have an idol of their career? Their family? Money? Uh, power? Do some people struggle with wanting to be approved? Yes. Some people out for success? Their entertainment? It goes on and on, doesn't it? We just have idols of different kinds, things that are so, are so important to us that we put above our relationship with Jesus Christ. So idolatry is producing spiritual and moral disintegration, and this is accentuated by her determined effort. We are going to destroy the worship of Jehovah. There can be no worship of God, nothing about the Bible. Do we see that coming in our land? Okay, we know that there is a talk recently that places like casinos, and I'm trying to think of the other one. Anyway, they can have 50% of their occupancy rate can come into the casino. So if a casino can handle regularly 2,000 people, they can have 1,000 people come to the casino. But a church, they want to limit to 50 people. Now, our church can accommodate around 1,000, 1,100 people. That means we should be able to have about 450 to 500 people in here at a time, right? right? No, the church, they're trying to get down to only 50 people. Now, that's not in Oklahoma yet, but what goes out other places if it gets passed and passed and passed? Do we see how they want to destroy the worship of the God of the Bible? You and I are the enemy. And if, God, if Jesus doesn't come back before too long, you and I are going to be sought. Are you preparing your heart? We need to be. So here's the Pope again. And he, I believe, is trying to destroy the worship of God. And I just I referenced his recent statement that he says it is not important. In fact, it can be dangerous to try to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. He is trying to destroy the worship of the true God. And I've told you, we talked about last week, the opening of Chrislam in 2022 in Abu Dhabi. So Jezebel is not satisfied just to establish the religion in Israel. She's got 850 ministers going out, and they're just they're spewing all of the uh, teachings, of the false teachings, trying to get everybody to come under her thumb. But she is, wants to stamp out every remnant of Jehovah worship, and she's out to kill every true prophet of God. This religious system that is coming will seek to destroy every believer of Jesus Christ. And we know that's coming. So what is her goal? She wants to even exterminate the worshipers. Now it's not, you can worship your God if you want, just be quiet about it. Now it's, you can't worship him at all. And she wants every person in uh, the land of Israel to serve Baal and come under her thumb and her religion, her way. I just found this on the internet. This is out in California. There's an 84-year-old woman who's being threatened with eviction from the California Veterans Home, where she lives, if she continues to host Bible studies there. It's coming. Are we getting ready? Here's another one. On the right... Uh, home Bible studies in many states and counties, depending on where you are and if it's liberal or conservative, they are banning in-home Bible studies. I found this sign. This was uh, coming into a town in California. It says, beware of the book, and it's a Bible. So the question is, if the Bible, if this is just mere fantasy, don't they say that? They say it's just mere fantasy. This isn't the authoritative, inspired word of God. If that's true, why is it banned and restricted in 52 countries? This is the book they want to ban. They want to get you in trouble if you read this book. Nobody goes to jail for reading Harry Potter, which is full of satanic stuff. 
Nobody goes to jail for reading Alice in Wonderland. But can you go to jail for this? In some places, even in the United States, you can and receive a fine. So she is obsessed for domineering control of others. Now she's a mass murderer. In 1 Kings 18, 4 to 13, it says, When Jezebel, she cut off the prophets of the Lord, all of them that were there, but there's a guy named Obadiah, not the one that wrote the book. He found a hundred of them, and he put 50 in a cave, and 50 in another cave, and he gave them bread and water. But she, she was trying to kill all the prophets of God. Anybody that spoke about the God of the Bible, she was going to kill them. She became the first religious female persecutor in history. Was she did, did, she, did she have zeal and passion? And it inspired her to exterminate the worship of the true and living God. Can Satan put all that zeal and passion in the wrong person? Absolutely. And she almost succeeded in the attempt to get rid of all of God's prophets. Her strongest enemy was Elijah. And he challenged those 850 prophets of Baal and Ashtaroth to a supreme test of power on the top of Mount Carmel. And we all know that Jehovah won, right? She didn't care. We know Jehovah won over the prophets of Baal, over the gods of Baal, but she didn't care. The people uh, with Elijah seized the priest of Baal and they massacred him. They got rid of him. You would think when she saw how powerful the God of the Bible was, Jehovah, that she think she might have second thoughts and repent. Absolutely not. She swore she's going to relentlessly pursue Elijah and take his life now. She's guilty of malice in taking revenge against a prophet of God. And she, Ahab came home and told Jezebel everything Elijah did and how with all, he slew all of your prophets of Baal with the sword. She sent a messenger to Elijah, and she said, So let the gods do to me, and even more, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Wicked. Wicked. She is stubborn. Now, some people have told me I'm stubborn. Uh, I believe his first name starts with a P. Her stubborn, he hasn't, he hasn't seen stubbornness, believe me. Her stubborn refusal to submit to the power of the living God is going to lead to her hideous end. We see that with Jezebel. We're going to see it with the harlot in chapter 17 of Revelation. She was a corrupt tree. Jesus used a striking figure to illustrate the continuing influence of evil that emanates from a life that has no godly principles. No godly principles. You know, the Holy Spirit's not living in them. It's Satan that they uh, are, Satan is using them. Now, he goes to Matthew, and in chapter 7, does he tell us that we will know people by their fruits? Yes. Yes. Do men gather grapes of thorns? Do they get figs off of thistles? A good tree produces good fruit, an evil tree produces evil fruit. And the question for you and me, what sort of fruit is being produced in my life? We are to examine ourselves. A corrupt tree is going to bring forth evil fruit. Can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit? No. No. She is a rotten root and a rotten branch, and everything connected with her would become contaminated. Her offspring even imbibed. You remember how they're drunk with the wine of her fornication and all of her seducing? Her offspring become the same way, and they continue the wickedness that they grew up in. Jezebel's evil influence was revived in her daughter Athaliah. If you don't know her story, look it up. Of Judea. Her malign character reappears in her eldest son, Ahaziah, who becomes a devout worshiper of Baal. Her second son, Jehoram, or Joram, was another corrupt fruit from a corrupt tree. Now we're going to go to another event in their life to show that she is a treacherous schemer. And it's going to end in tragedy. 
Now, the corrupt tree reveals how despicable a woman Jezebel was. Life was cheap to her, right? Kind of like all these people that are killing all the children and the abortions and so forth. Life was cheap because she has murder in her veins. She had a beautiful palace in Samaria, in northern Israel. They called it the Ivory House. But because they needed more, they built another palace in Jezreel, which was only 25 miles to the north, because it was more moderate in the wintertime. So they had palaces. She, but Ahab goes out one day, and he is coveting the fruitful vineyard that belonged to Naboth who is a fellow Israelite. He offered to buy it from him, and Naboth said, it's not for sale. Was he abiding by God's law? Yes, because according to the Israelite custom and law, it dictated their family had to maintain their land in perpetuity to go on down through the generations. God said he forbid them to sell their paternal inheritance. So Naboth is just obeying what God's word says. As an Israelite, should Ahab have understood this? He should have known it. He's the king, but thwarted in what he coveted. After all he's got, he wants more. He went to bed, turned his face to the wall, and refused to eat. Like a very mature person. Now, with her Phoenician background, in Phoenicia... The wishes of the king were never questioned. The king got what the king wanted, so she couldn't understand this. And she, she said, you're subject to the laws of God? Because that was not true. That just another thought that came. Did y'all go in my brain with me? Another thought. Even the king of Israel, she said, you're subject to the laws of your God? See, the... the spiritual system that's coming is wants to change laws okay that just popped in my mind she says get up you exercise authority over israel you could take anything you want arise get up and be cheerful i will give you oh that deceitful thing you covet something that you're not supposed to have i'll give it to you i'm going to give you that vineyard of naboth so the treacherous scheme begins to unfold now her false accusations and her slander were a method to control people that she hated or whose possessions she coveted and is she's prepared to do murder if I have to get what I want. Boy, have we seen that. Jezebel, she goes and she gets a letter and it's stamped with the royal seal and she's going to call a public fast. You know, throw in a little religion here. So then they have this, this banquet. And she seats Naboth with high honor among the people and seats two men who are scoundrels to bear witness against him for his, his blasphemies against God and the king. Who's the witness that heard that? They're going to lie. We're getting false witnesses here. And they, they, it was believed, and they take him out and his sons, and they stone him, and an innocent life is now gone. So what happens? She goes back to the king. Guess what? He died. Get up. Go take possession of that, that thing you wanted so bad. You can now have it. You can now have it. Isaiah 5.20 Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. I want us to consider the sins and the commandments that they broke. And it all started with idolatry and then coveting. Okay, so let's go through these quickly. The sins of Ahab and Jezebel and the commandments that they broke. First, they broke commandment number one from Exodus 20. I am the Lord your God and you shall have no other gods before me. Number two... You shall not make for yourself any kind of idol, no carved or graven image that resembles anything, right? So that's the first two that they have broken. Now, she brings Baal worship to Israel, and who permitted it? The king 
of the land permitted it. Now you keep get when I when we're saying things here, you keep putting yourself in the present. Okay, and you can see all of the parallels. So he permits it. What was the message to the church at Thyatira? You're permitting and you're allowing. Now, what happened when he permitted it? What happened to the worship of Baal? It spread through the whole land because the king permitted it. If we permit false teaching and doctrines in our church, will it spread through the church? It sure will. Okay. I'm trying to get y'all's brain connected with mine. Now, if you take a U-turn away from the truth of God's word, is it evident that you're believing a lie? Yes. Do you start, I think I love that lie. Yeah. You know, I know this isn't quite right, but... I sure want that or I want to do that, this little indulgence. And what's going to happen very soon? You're being controlled. You're being controlled by the lies. You have a license to sin. That's what was wrong at the church at Galatia. They thought they could sin and it was okay. Thou shalt not covet. After they have idolatry and they made the idols, now we're going to jump to number 10. Because this was where they fell down. They started coveting. Thou shalt not covet. Ahab and Jezebel already had a summer palace at Jezreel, and he wanted that vineyard right next to it that belonged to Naboth. A powerful people can acquire one thing after another, but in all their acquiring, are they ever really satisfied? No. They just want, and then they want... This is from Thoreau. He says, A man is rich in proportion to the number of things he can afford to let alone. Isn't that a wise statement? He goes on to say, Superfluous wealth can buy superfluities only. Stuff I don't really need. I'm trying to downsize. Get rid of stuff. But it's a, not a secret. I live with a pack rat. Money is not required to buy one necessity for my soul. True? True. Not one thing my soul needs do I need money to buy it. He goes on to say, Thou shalt not covet is the last of the Ten Commandments, but it's probably the most difficult to obey. Boy, things that appeal to our flesh that we just think we have to have. It deals with the hidden desires of the heart. And a covetous heart will lead us to disobey all the other commandments of God. And we're going to see that right now with Jezebel. So what happened? I got idols first. And then I coveted. And after I coveted number 10, then I broke number 9. And now what am I doing? It says you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Well, did the coveting lead to that? Now they're breaking commandment number 9. The truth, truth is the cement that holds our society together. What happens when there is no truth in the land? When, when truth is gone, everything starts to fall apart. Truth is now the new hate speech. <laughs> you know, my speech is probably hated a lot. People like Laura, whoa, truth, is, her speech is hated a lot. More and more opposition. More people are accusing her of hate speech. Y'all pray for her and that ministry. During times of universal deceit, is there deceit all through our land? Telling the truth becomes a revolutionary act. Not many people standing up for truth. In Isaiah 59, he says, Justice will be turned back. Righteousness will stand far away because truth has stumbled in the public square. And uprightness can't even enter the public square any longer. Jezebel was a resolute woman. She never allowed truth to stand in the way of what she wanted. She fabricated an official lie. Did it look official? It was on the king's stationery. It was sealed with an official seal. 
But no amount of royal adornment, however official it looked, can change the fact they were breaking God's law. Now, after they coveted, and then they had to get false witnesses, number six says, you shall not murder. That followed. The procedure she outlined was in agreement with the law. She did it by the way of the Israelite law. But the accusation was false, the witnesses were liars, and the judges had been bought off by royal intimidation. In every town, can you always find some men of Belial? That's Satan. Worthless fellows. Oh, they'll do anything for money. They'll do anything to be important. See that spirit of Babylon? Success in my status. A lot of people will be paid off to do whatever you want them to do. And she found two false witnesses. Nobody but Ahab, maybe Jezebel, heard Naboth refuse to sell. He, it's a law of the land. I mean, God's law that I can't sell it. There's nothing in his words that can be interpreted as blasphemy. Now, after this, what happens? Now they're going to steal. Commandment number eight. Consider the sins, and now they're going to steal what is not theirs. The weak rulers in Naboth's city followed Jezebel's orders. Naturally, she's a very controlling, influential woman. Huh? Yes, they want to live. Yep, so you do what the bad person says. They had an illegal trial. They took Naboth and his sons outside the city, and they stoned them. So they got rid of all the heirs also. Nobody in the family's alive. Look, nobody's here to inherit the land. I can take it. But the land did not belong to Ahab. Who does the land of Israel belong to? God himself. It was they actually stealing property from God. So here's... In 1 Kings 21, 25, listen to these sad words. There was none like unto Ahab. He sold himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord. And who stirred him up to do it? His wife Jezebel, who is a type, I believe, of the harlot riding the beast. I believe she was a type of that so if we compare Jezebel with the harlot now, we'll just do a couple of wrap-ups here. Look at the false system that's coming, what, we'll, what we will learn and what we've learned about it, and look at Jezebel and her life. Jezebel's religious system is a counterfeit of the truth church of Jesus Christ. Is the new religious system coming into the tribulation period, is it a counterfeit? Yes, but many people are going to be following it because it's promoting unity and diversity. Jesus Christ asks the disciples, and he asks Peter specifically, he says, whom do you say that I am? And what was Peter's answer? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus told him, Blessed are you, because flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but God in heaven revealed it to you, and it's on this rock, not Peter. What was it built on, the church built on? That Christ is the Son of the living God. That's what it's built on. And you and I, he is he building the church? We are the body of Christ. And it says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. Amen. Amen. So I believe Jezebel is a fitting symbol for the Roman Catholic papacy that was very influential and dominated Europe during the dark ages of Europe for about a thousand years. The Jezebel spirit always puts herself in alignment with a religious spirit. The evil she perpetrated is done under the guise of religion. That's exactly what the Pope said for a thousand years, all of them. And that's what they're going to be saying soon. She used her influence to lead God's people astray. Her goal is always control. Her spirit is motivated by her own agenda, and she will relentlessly pursue her goal. She never accepts guilt. The word says, repent. She doesn't know what that is. That's not in her vocabulary. 
She doesn't repent, and she's always very defensive. The harlot has and will shed the blood of the saints and all of those who profess Jesus Christ. When we sit back and you and I allow wickedness to go unchecked, we allow false teaching and false doctrines to come from the pulpit or from our Sunday school, whoever's teaching you, we are inviting the anger and judgment of God. Did he call the church out for allowing and permitting it? He did. When false doctrine is being preached, those who know the truth have a duty to stand up and say something about it. A.W. Tozer says, We must never allow the majority to overrule the clear teaching of God's word. Remember Athanasius? They said, Athanasius, come on. You're against the whole world. He said, that's all right. He said, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and it doesn't matter if I'm the only one that believes it. If you and I let down the wall just a little and we compromise with the world, the world will stop, not stop, until it has everything you and I value. We will be left with nothing but the anger of a holy God. Some churches pride themselves on tolerance. We have an example here. There's many examples. What does Jesus tell you and I? Come out from among them and be separate. Does he expect you and I to be different? Yes. yes. Does he give us what we need in order to be different? Yes. He equips us. We have the Holy Spirit within us, and we have the Word of God. When we compromise our standards to appeal to the world, I'm turning my back on truth. What does he tell them in Revelation 17 and 18 about the Babylon and the Babylon spirit? Come out of her. We don't want anything to do with the spirit of Babylon. When we open the door to let the world in... We should not be surprised if the Lord Jesus Christ walks out. Let's pray. Father, once again we come to you and we are humbled by your word. And Lord, we see the seriousness of not being lured in, into deceiving teachings. They're called seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. And Lord, I pray that each of us would take the challenge to be a Berean, that we will take the challenge that we are to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that not, needeth not to be ashamed, and rightly divide the word of truth. We know that each one of us are responsible to you. And I just pray that you will give us that zeal and that passion to study your word so that we know what truth is. And it tells us the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. And Lord, I pray you will keep us and put a hedge around us and keep the, the lives of the Babylonian spirit away from us and away from our church. Father, I pray now that as we go and enjoy a time of fellowship together, I pray that you will just bless the hands that have prepared the food for us, those that are serving us, and I just pray that we will have a wonderful time just fellowshipping with one another. We thank you for the spiritual food we've had, and we thank you for the physical food that we're about to partake of. And Lord, we just want everything in our life, everything we say and do, to be to the glory of Jesus Christ, our Savior. May our eyes keep focused on him who is coming for us, and he has not destined us for this wrath that is to come. In whose name we pray, amen. Now, I just want to say, there's a few of you here that may not have signed up for the lunch, but I have about four or five that signed up that didn't get to come. So if you would like to stay, I'm sure uh, there's plenty for all of us. And so if you would like to stay, we're going to take a short break, and we'll be downstairs. Uh, there's an elevator to your left, and I think most of you know the way. And here is my plea. Do not let anyone be sitting alone. Introduce yourself if you don't know them, and make sure nobody is sitting by themselves. Right? We are all sisters, and we are one in the bond of love.
right? Okay, I'll see y'all downstairs shortly.